Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is May 11th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of different ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. To call in, please dial 1-669-900-6833. The collaboration code is 813-4736-0347. This information is also posted on our Planning Department homepage. During key points in today's meeting, time will be time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if calling in by telephone by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. If at any time you have difficulty connecting to, to today's meeting via the link or by phone, please email Michael Lamb at michael.lamb at santacruzcounty.us. He will be checking his email periodically throughout the meeting and he's on standby to assist anyone who's having difficulty connecting. All right, with those instructions, I'll turn it over to the Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Good morning everyone. And uh, thank you, Jocelyn, for that intro and welcome everyone to the hearing of the Santa Cruz County Planning Commission today on May 11th, 2022. And it's 9.32, so let's call this meeting to order. Can we please have a roll call, Ms. Drake? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Commissioner Shepard? You're muted. I am present, thank you. All right. Commissioner Schaefer Freitas? Mm -hmm. Present. All right, and Chair Gordon. Here, thank you. Thank you. All right, move on to agenda item number two here. Do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda today? Uh, no, we do not. Okay. We would like to note that if anyone is happen to, does happen to be on for item number nine, then it has been rescheduled. So. Um, if anyone is here on the public for that item, we will not be heard today. Um, and we can move on to agenda item number three. Do any commissioners have any ex parte communications that they would like to declare? I do. Yes. I, I did speak with the owner of the property immediately across from 2740. That's on the um, item number eight. Any other commissioners? Okay. Uh, then we can move on to item number four at this time, oral communications. This is the time when members of the public have the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda today. Uh, Ms. Drake, do we have any members of the public that would like to talk at this time? I will check. So as a reminder, this is the time to press star nine on your phone if you're participating via telephone. And I'm not seeing any members of the public who wish to speak, Chair. All right, great, thank you. We can go ahead and close oral communications at this time and move on to item uh, five and six, the consent agenda items. Um, today, the consent agenda items are the AB 361 resolution and the uh, extension of the minor land division of the project uh, application number 221030. Um, 
like to give the commissioners opportunity for any minor discussions prior to looking for a motion on the consent items. And if there's not any, if anyone would like to make a motion. I'll move approval of the consent uh, agenda. Thank you. I'll second that. This is Judy. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard and Commissioner Lazenby. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Then at this time, we can take a vote. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Great. That motion passes. And we can move on to the next regular agenda item. Approval of minutes from the March 5th Planning Commission hearing. 5th or the 9th? It might be the March 9th hearing. Um, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so March Thank 9th. Thank you for that, Tim. Yes. <laughs> Uh, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the, the uh, I move that we approve the minutes of the March 9th Planning Commission meeting, 2022. Thank you. And I will second that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Then we have a motion as second. We can take a vote on this as well. All commissioners in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Great. That motion passes as well. And we can move on. Moving right along today. Right on to our um, next agenda item, item number eight. This is application number 201208, located at 2740 Madison Lane. It's a proposal to develop a 10-unit dwelling group in the RM6 zone district. Ms. Drake, do we have staff and the applicant available for this item? And may we please have a staff report? Um, and we have Lizanne Jeffs from the planning department joining us, and she's going to give the presentation. Good morning, Lizanne. Good morning, everybody. And I do apologize for that uh, technical difficulty there, but uh, hopefully everything goes smoothly from now on. So uh, let's start. So, so this. Um, the project is located on the south side of Madison Lane. Um, it's approximately 1,000 feet south of the intersection with Soquel Drive. And um, the Highway 1 runs along the southern property boundary, and that is designated as a scenic road in the county's general plan. The site consists of two contiguous parcels of land. There's APN 025-21102, which is approximately 2.02 .02 acres in size, and APN 025-21107, which is approximately 0.73 acres in size. And together, they total approximately 2.75 acres. The net developable land of the parcel um, is about 1.97 acres, which excludes all of the areas within the Madison Lane right-of-way and all areas within the riparian corridor along Rodeo Creek Gulch and also any lands within the associated 50-foot riparian buffer that are slopes greater than 30% as shown on this map. The parcels are located in the RM, or multifamily residential uh, zone district, which allows for multifamily residential uses. And the proposed residential dwelling group is a principal permitted use within the zone district. The RM6 zoning is consistent with the site's urban low density residential general plan designation that covers most of the project site. There is a portion of APN 025-21102 that has a general plan designation of open urban open space, and that corresponds with the non-developable portion of the parcel located within the riparian corridor along Rodeo Creek Gulch. The project is also consistent with the goals, guiding principles, and strategies of the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan. Um, to the east and west and north of the project site, um, the, the area is surrounded by a varied neighborhood uh, that includes one and two-story single-family dwellings, uh, which are, include older and renovated residences that are predominantly a ranch style. In addition, across Madison Lane to the northwest is a school campus, the, the Good Shepherd School, 
and that serves students from preschool through to eighth grade. And as I said before, to the south of the project site is Highway 1. Um, the property itself is relatively level and is mainly comprised of open grassland. However, along the eastern property boundary, the site slopes down towards Rodeo Creek Gulch. And this area contains a mixed riparian woodland. In addition, there's a 40 foot wide area of trees and other vegetation in the Caltrans Highway uh, right away, which creates a buffer that separates the project site from Highway 1. So the proposal is to develop a two, um, the two adjacent vacant parcels with a 10 unit apartment complex and all of the associated site improvements where uh, the 10 proposed units would be grouped into five two story duplex style buildings. It's also proposed that the project will be constructed in two phases where phase one includes four duplex style buildings totaling eight units that are numbered A through H. And at that stage, um, all site improvements would be constructed. And phase two, which includes the addition of a further smaller duplex, which is numbered I and J. Um, the reason it's broken down into two phases is because of the um, Rana Gulch Rodeo um, Creek Sewer Moratorium, which only allows for a maximum of four units to be built on each parcel at this stage until sewer upgrades have been completed. Um, so the proposed project complies with the allowed density for the urban low density residential general plan designation of the site based on the net developable area of the parcel, which would provide that a minimum of eight units are required to be built um, and the maximum density that would be allowed would be 14 units. So, and, and in addition, um, the project will also comply with all of the applicable site and development standards for parcels in the RM6 zone district as set out in County Code Section 1310.323. As proposed, units A through F would each have a habitable floor area of 1,902 square feet, and units G and H would have a habitable floor area of 1,713 square feet. All eight of these units that are going to be built in the first phase are proposed to be built. Um, have, they have four bedrooms and three bathrooms, and each includes a 441 square foot two car garage. Within each duplex style building, the two units are connected at the garage common wall. And um, these plans here, um, you can just see one of the two pairs of units, but the garage wall is where they're joined. Um, the uh, units I and J that will be constructed at the second phase are both 1,200 square feet and each contain two bedrooms and two bathrooms, but these units do not include garages. Set out in County Code Section 1310.552A, three off-street resident parking spaces are required for each of the four-bedroom multifamily dwelling units, and then two and a half parking spaces are required for a two-bedroom multifamily dwelling unit. Then in addition to the resident parking, guest parking is required to be provided in amount equal to 20% of the resident parking, which results in a requirement for a total of 35 spaces. As proposed, the project will fully comply with these requirements in that a total of 38 spaces will be provided, including 32 spaces for the eight units that will be constructed during phase one. Um, of which 16 are garage spaces, eight spaces are located in front of the garage doors, and there are an additional eight guest parking spaces. Then for phase two, uh, there will be an additional six spaces for the two units that will be constructed at that time. It should be noted that there are eight additional parking spaces that are potentially available in front of the garage doors um, at, of units um, A through H they were necessary. So each of those units potentially would have four spaces. The project will result in approximately 34,076 square feet of new impervious area. All of the site runoff associated with the project will be directed to Rodeo Creek and will comply with all county regulations. Um, the flood control or detention and water quality bio or, or biofiltration measures have been included into the proposed drainage design. Um, and the system will also be sized so that the detention volume is provided uh, in, a, in storage volume beyond that required for the project alone. 
so that the entire watershed, including off-site impervious areas at Madison Lane, will be directed to the project drainage system. In addition, uh, to reduce runoff, uh, pervious surfacing will be included into the final project design, including along the proposed sidewalk on the Madison Lane frontage. Rodeo Creek Gulch runs within a, an arroyo along the eastern property line, and the land that is within that arroyo meets the definition of a riparian corridor in accordance with County Code Section 16.30.030. This portion of the project site, which is also mapped as containing riparian woodland, is characterized by oak woodland with other riparian vegetation. The completed project is not expected to create any permanent impacts to the riparian corridor or to any sensitive habitats associated with it. This is because all components of the project, including the residential buildings, the associated site improvements, uh, the detention retention pond, and the storm drain outlet outfall will all be located outside of the required riparian buffer and outside the associated construction setback from the arroyo. Um, and it's in an area that's characterized by primarily non-native grassland. Further protect the riparian corridor and any associated habitat areas. The project proposes installation of a permanent split rail fence at the boundary of the 50-foot buffer, which will protect the arroyo from further disturbance. And then to further ensure that there will be a minimum impact to special status species or their habitat, the project has also been conditioned to include all mitigations as recommended by the project biologist and the project arborist to ensure protection of native oak and other sensitive habitat and species associated with the project site. To the south, as I have said, the project abuts Highway 1. However, the development will not be visible from Highway 1 due to both the change in elevation and the existing row of trees and other vegetation along the southern property line that are within the right-of-way. In addition to the existing vegeta vegetative <laughs> screen, the applicant is proposing to construct an eight-foot high sound wall along the edge of the Caltrans right-of-way that will screen the proposed development um, in views from the travel lanes. The wall itself may be just visible beneath the canopy of the trees that will match other walls along the highway and so will not have a significant visual impact. Further, the existing oaks and other vegetation in the right-of-way will be retained and protected, so they'll continue to screen and soften the development in views from the scenic road. The proposed project will incorporate um, design features such as varied wall planes, a palette of muted earth tone colors, and it includes accent details such as wide window and door trims and natural wood trellises. These features, together with landscaping, that will be both within the project site and along the project frontage at Madison Lane and will include trees and other plantings will help to reduce the visual impact of the proposed development on the surrounding neighborhood and on the natural landscape. Uh, in addition, all of the existing trees that surround and are within the property will be retained and protected. So in conclusion, the project as proposed and conditioned is consistent with all of the applicable codes and policies of the zoning ordinance and the general plan, and staff therefore recommends that your commission adopt the CEQA mitigated negative declaration and mitigation measures and reporting program that is related to the proposed project and certify the mitigated neg deck pursuant to the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act and then approve application number 201208 based on the findings and the conclusions within the staff report. With my presentation. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Jessup. We really appreciate that thorough presentation. Um, I'd like to ask the commissioners if they had any questions of staff at this time. I have. Oh, sorry, I had a question too. I did not mute fast enough, so I'm happy to wait. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I I didn't see anything in in my file that showed that there was a water will serve for this project, or a sewer will serve letter, or fire requirements. 
They are on file uh, with the planning department. They were uh, sent in. I did not include them in the packet. I apologize for that. Um, there's also will be required to be provided uh, together with any building permit application when that comes in as well. Well, I was looking for dates to see if they were still current. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have that information with me here since I'm at home right now. Um, I can check the project applicant is here, so um, they should have that information available. Maybe when the applicant has an opportunity to speak, they could um, have that information available for us. That would be appreciated. Okay. Does that work for you, Commissioner Lazenby? That'll be fine. Thank you. Do you have any other questions, Commissioner Lazenby? Not at this time. No, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Shepard? Yeah, um, this may be also appropriate for the uh, developer, but uh, are these, do these homes have appropriate orientation for solar? Um, is solar an option for these houses? I thought we were going to look at that with most new construction. The homes are oriented in an east-west, although units G and H, uh, the roof lines are oriented north-south. Um, that was, uh, there hasn't been any discussion with this project to including solar panels, but um, that's something I think that the, the developers should answer that question. Yeah, maybe the developer could comment on that potential when he gives his presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Commissioner Freitas, did you have any comments or questions at this time? No, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I did have a couple, um, kind of along the similar lines as Commissioner Lazenby's. Is is there a reason that it seems like a lot of the conditions are things that would sometimes be already included at this point? Um, geotech report and some other things that that aren't. Is that uh, going to be a challenge or are those reports actually all done? We just didn't see them. Could you comment um, on that, Ms. Jeff? Yeah, the reports are done. They're actually all, of, they're all available uh, to the public uh, in the, the, well, the proposed report included in the package for the initial study. Um, but they are on file with the planning department. Uh, during the building permit stage, plan review letters will be required from the civil engineers. Okay, great. So that is all there. Okay. Yes, it is all there. Okay. Um, Chair? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say the sewer, water, geotechnical, if they're done, they, we would always like to see copies. We always have in the past. So going forward. Yeah, I apologize you, for not including those. Um, is there any affordability requirement to this project? Um, they will be paying the affordable in lieu fees based on the square footage of the development. Okay, so it's going to be an in lieu fee. There's not any actual affordable units being created. Okay. Um, the last question I had, this might also be for the developer, um, eight units being a kind of the bottom range of the density allowed. Is there a reason why there's only eight? I know that, you know, just kind of doing some of my own calculations, um, uh, there, this well, project could hold a lot more if it wasn't, you know. Uh, uh, originally, a larger project was discussed, but because of the sewer moratorium, the maximum number of units that can be developed is eight at the current time. Um, that's the reason why this project is including two phases. So there are eight units during phase one where they're limited to four units for each of the two parcels. And then as uh, the second phase, there'll be two additional units that will be added. Okay, understood. Maybe um, it'd be nice to know if, it seems like that moratorium is kind of an older challenge and I'm sure it's 
a big problem that it's hard to comprehend at this level, but is there a end to that? Is that going to be fixed at some point in the future or are those two units going to just sit there kind of indefinitely or do we know what the plan is? I believe that the funding is available um, either later this year or next year. I, I believe we have someone from Public Works who could maybe answer that question, but it is in the foreseeable future. And um, it's likely that those improvements will be um, taking, taking place sort of concurrently probably with this development so that maybe they can move straight on. The timing is still yet to be determined, but um, I know that this, the, the board is voting on the improvements fairly shortly. That should move right. ahead. All right, so there would be an opportunity to get those two in at least and then that's my understanding that it's in it's in the foreseeable future. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. That was all my questions. Um, unless any commissioners had any follow up questions, we could invite the applicant to present at this time if they have a presentation today. Okay. Let's see. So I see Jim is with us this morning. Good morning, Jim. Will you please state your name for the record? Oh. And you need to unmute yourself by pressing star six if you're on your phone. Jim Weaver. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, all. Thank you for this opportunity and would like to very much start with thanking staff for getting us to this point. Um, this has been quite a long haul and to sort of catch up a little bit and elaborate on um, Lizanne's presentation. This project started as a 24 unit project and six of those were going to be affordable. Um, four were going to be moderate and two were going to be low income. But because of the moratorium, we spent about two years processing and then we we're finally told that the Public Works Department wasn't sure when the moratorium would be lifted and that we needed to revise the project and go down to what was allowed under the moratorium, which was four units on each lot. So that's kind of how we got there. And um, we do have will serve letters, which were provided in November of 2021 for water and October of 2021 for sanitation. We also had earlier letters for the first 26 units. So I think um, those should be in the file somewhere. Um, and other than that, I have just a couple of quick, easy questions for staff. I don't really have any other presentation to make. I think Lizanne did an excellent job as usual and um, presented the project and did a really nice job with all the, uh, the photos. So if you want, I can let you know what my two questions are. They have to do with a couple of the conditions of approval. And I'm just not clear on how um, how those are worded and, and what they actually mean. Yes, absolutely. You can definitely ask those questions. I think that would be a okay. fine use of this time. And then we can um, follow back up with a couple of the questions that the commissioner yeah. had of you. And then, yeah, that should be Sounds good. good. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, condition 6A on page 25 of the staff report talks about a, a, a four foot sign easement, and I'm not really clear at all what that means. And then the other question I have is on condition number 12 on page 24, talks about a private maintenance um, for sewer laterals and easements, but we're in a public street, and I'm not sure how that quite works. Other than that, we're happy with all the conditions, feel like we can meet them. And as um, was asked earlier, all the reports have been prepared and most of them have been updated because they were prepared years ago. And then we had to update them for um, the revised project. 
Miss Jess, would you be able to comment on this? Am I still live? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, both of those conditions are conditions. Um, see what, so the first one was um, six on which page, Jim? Um, page 25. 6A talks about a four-foot sign easement, and I just can't figure out quite what that is. Is that under a B, C, D? 6A. G, 6A. G, 6A, sorry. G, 6A, right. I don't have the same numbering pages. The G, 6. Um, yes, this was a 6A. Yeah, that was something that came, it was a condition of approval from the road engineering section. Um, I believe that there was a plan markup that was sent to you um, as one of the completeness or incompleteness comments. Um, and it, I know that that is available from uh, Greg Martin in the um, road engineering section. And so, um, and I, I believe that somebody should be available from road engineering to answer that question. I had, um, had asked that somebody was there because you had made that question. So um, to clarify that, it's, it's um, either Russell Chen or um, Greg Martin available to speak on that item? Um, I am seeing Rachel raising her hand. Um, so Rachel Fatui with um, DPW Drainage. So I will check in with Rachel. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning. Uh, so I I raised my hand because of the comment about that the 12 comment rather than the signage easement. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. So we'll keep you on the line and we'll get back to you. Let's see. Do we have anyone from the Department of Public Works? road section. I am not seeing anyone. Um, let's see. We do not have anyone from the Department of Public Works road section to just that comment. Sounds, oh yeah. Is this something that we could potentially follow up with after the hearing? Oh. I've got Absolutely. Matt. Yes, let's see. Um, Matt Machado has his hand raised. So let me see if Matt has anything to add here. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, all. Thank you. Um, you know what? I think uh, as we discuss some of the other points, we could get um, someone from the road division on the line. So I, I will work on that. I did want to mm -hmm. uh, ask Jim. Um, I, I missed part of his comment about the sewer moratorium. I did want to provide the commission a quick update on that. And I, I, I just missed a, a bit of that comment, but I know the, the sewer moratorium project, the projects that, that's going to lift that moratorium is going to construction later this year. And it's my understanding that once the sanitation group awards a contract, they will be providing will serve letters and pursuing the lift of the moratorium. And I, I might've missed a part of that comment earlier. So I just wanted to share that information and, and I'll, I'll stop with that. And then, then I'll um, pursue getting a uh, staff member on the call here just in a couple minutes. Uh, and Matt, I believe that the plan markup was from Greg Martin. Okay, thank you. I'll get him on the line. Thanks, Matt. Um, let's see. Let me move on to question on 12A, the, mm -hmm. uh, the next um, condition of approval question that you had, Jim. Yes. So it's talking about a private, which would be the project, um, maintaining the sewer um, uh, drainage and stuff, but we're in a public street, so I'm not familiar with quite how that would work. Um, normally, I would think Public Works would maintain all of that, but maybe I'm missing something. Okay. 
Um, I see Matt is raising his hand again. <laughs> Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, I do. I, I will share on that. And so that condition is uh, the laterals are uh, privately owned and maintained. The sewer main in the road is the sanitation district responsibility, but any uh, laterals that come off the main are privately owned and maintained. And that would include any on-site uh, lateral or sewer connections on site. And so does that clarify, Jim? Uh, it's It's the a part of that lateral is in the public right of way, but the but the lateral is right. still the private ownership and maintenance. I agree with what you're saying about the laterals. The condition reads the maintenance of the proposed inlets and storm drain in Madison Lane shall be responsibility of the property owner. Oh, storm drain. Okay, I thought we were talking sewer laterals. Um, <laughs> I, I think Rachel might still be on the call. Rachel, uh, can you chime mm -hmm. in on, on that condition? Yes, I, I'm unmuted now. Uh, the, the improvements that are shown on the plan are not uh, made for county design criteria standards. They are 10 inch. And even though we said shall be 12 inch, even a 12 inch is not for our design criteria. So if you do the standard requirement for per the design criteria, which is a minimum of 18 inch pipe in the right of way, uh, even though the, there is an the whole road in that area looked like an easement, but we do maintain that part of the road. So you would need to build it per our design criteria for us to accept the portion in the right of way. Once it leaves the right of way, it's still going to be yours to maintain. Uh, but within the right of way, you need to build it per our design criteria. Okay, so we can submit that as part of the building permit. Yeah, it would need to be 18 inch pipe minimum. And what we see on the plan, you have also a smaller pipe on your property. So the hydraulic will have to be figured out by your engineer to see how you go from larger pipe to smaller pipe. Okay. But we, we will need it to be 18 inch in the right of way. So do right. we need to change the condition of approval to reflect that um, 12 applies as is if unless the storm drain is upsized to be 18 inches to meet county design criteria? Yeah, I mean, the comment can go like, unless the uh, improvements within the right of way built for the design criteria, the, the comment stands. Yeah, okay, I can add that as a change to the conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like Greg Martin joined in the attendee list, Ms. Drake. Yep, I see him. Let's see. Good morning, Greg. Yes, you're unmuted. Okay. Good uh, morning. I heard you had a question about sign easements. <laughs> yes, Jim Weaver, the applicant, had a question. Um, Jim, would you like to repeat your question? The, um, the condition talks, um, it's G6A, and it says a four-foot sign easement is provided as shown on the plan markup, and I'm just unclear as to what that actually is. The sign I can talk in general. Typically, that's behind the sidewalk uh, and it allows you to preserve your setbacks from the back of the sidewalk. And so uh, we consider it like part of the street section, uh, and but we're allowing it instead of being separated sidewalk with a landscape strip uh, separ uh, separated, um, it's on uh, the landscaping is on the back side. And so we're doing it as a, and then we also want the ability to put signs. Uh, in that area. And so that's uh, the overall philosophy. I'm not looking at these specific plans uh, right now. Okay. All right, that, that answers that. Okay, I can go now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, bye. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for working through that so efficiently. Um, you know, I know as the applicant, sometimes it's 
you know, it's not always easy to get through the conditions of approval outside of this hearing. So I appreciate everyone's uh, uh, willingness to work through those questions for the applicant there. Um, Mr. Weaver, did you have any other questions or comments before we can respond to, to uh, one of, I think there's just one other question about solar and solar orientation from the commission that uh, we'd like to address. You know, other than the way the units are oriented, um, we didn't really push real hard for solar. Um, there's a fair number of windows. And of course, once you build under the Title 24 uh, energy requirements, most of the units will be pretty energy efficient, but we haven't proposed any solar panels on the homes. Okay, thank you. Um, Great, so then uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the commissioners to ask any follow-up or you know, have any uh, remaining comments for the applicant. Now would be the time to, to do that. Commissioner Lazenby, I saw you unmute. Did you have something? Uh, yes, I do. The, um, on page 17 of the conditions, at 16A, it says, Details showing compliance with fire department requirements. Now that's sort of an important thing. Do we have anyone from fire or do we have the report? Um, the plans were reviewed by the fire department during the processing of this permit um, and did provide comments to the applicant. Um, their comments generally um, they're lengthy, they say things like show fire sprinklers and show locations of fire hydrants. All of those um, requirements were passed along to the applicant and will be required to be included in the building plans. And then obviously the building plans themselves will go back to fire to ensure compliance. Um, but most of the comments are not really appropriate for conditions of approval because they are very much standard comments about what you need to show on your plans to meet fire department requirements. But otherwise the project itself has been found to be. Um, so they, they, approved, they approved the width of all of the lanes, the travel lanes, interior travel lanes? Yes. In fact, we, uh, we sent it back to them towards the end of the processing of this because there was a change to that turnaround close to when, where you go down towards units I and J. And um, that was reviewed by fire as well. So we, we know that they do approve all of those interior roadways. And there's no way we can see that or uh, check to make sure that all the details um, have been met, all the requirements have been met. Um, they, I mean, I do, the only way that I would have to show you would be to just to assure you that the project has been routed to fire and that they have approved the plans and deemed the application complete. And can you confirm at what stage they did this? A moment, let me take a quick look. When we, I, we did check in with them, um, right towards the end of the project, but I only took this project on fairly recently. See what we have here. While you're looking, Lizanne, I could speak a little bit to that. That would be great. Thanks, Jim. Because of the re the revisions to the plans and, and adding I and J, which came a little bit later than the first eight, We've worked pretty extensively with Jim Diaz at Central Fire to make sure that we have the right width and the right turnaround areas for them to get in and out of the property. And um, they've had Jim Diaz out on the site to look at things. So we're pretty comfortable that we can easily meet all the Central Fire's requirements. And they reviewed the last review, um, which was dated uh, June 29th of 2021. The project was complete on July 8th of 2021. So they were one of the latter reviewers. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners uh, have any follow-up questions or comments? Well, 
Um, I do. Um, I'm a little confused where we are in the process. Did we? Sure. We, we have we, a public hearing underway. We've heard right. from the applicant. Right. Um, and now we're hearing from commissioners, but um, are we going to open it up to the public? Absolutely. This was an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions of the applicant in particular while we right. had him on the line um, and to give him an opportunity to have his 10 minutes or so to present. And then as soon as we're done with these follow-up questions, opening up to public comment, uh, anyone that would like to speak on the project. Great. Thank you. Yes. I had one last question for the applicant was, you know, if the project was designed for more units and then got pulled back, but now that moratorium is going to go away, I mean, how are you feeling about that? Would you, clearly you're moving forward with this application, but it sounds like there's an opportunity to add more units again in the near future. Um, is that a possibility? You'd, something you'd pursue? You know, I would say at this point, no. We've been in this for over 10 years. And I think the the property owner, Sal Rubino, would just as well move forward with this project. There was also a meeting with the neighborhoods, you know, maybe eight, nine years ago for the 24 unit project. And they were very adamantly opposed to that number of units on this property, mainly due to potential traffic impacts. You do have the school across the street, which has its share of traffic. So when we redesigned down to the eight and then later the 10, we had a neighborhood meeting and everybody was way happier that we had reduced the scope of the project. So for those two reasons, time, money, and then the neighborhood compatibility, I would say that we just would prefer to stick with this and hopefully get her approved. Yes, I completely understand that. Thank you for uh, explaining that to me. Um, then if no other commissioner has questions of the applicant, we can move on to further public comment at this time. All right, so um, looking at our attendees, and I see a few hands raised. So we'll start with David Ramsey. Um, good morning, David. Will you please restate your name for the record? You have three minutes. Hello, my name is David Ramsey. Uh, I live right around the corner off of uh, Christie Courts, and Yes, we did have, uh, just to address Tim's comments real quick, we did um, have a neighborhood meeting with Jim. And uh, if you're familiar with Madison Lane, it's a very narrow uh, two-lane road, essentially one way with uh, with all the parking that goes on from the apartment complex um, near the school. Um, so the neighborhood was definitely more in favor of the eight units than anything else. Um, it's a very impacted road very busy at busy times. Um, for that reason, the corner as you come around Madison Lane is also a very sharp and blind corner with no sidewalks. And so we did discuss, you know, possibly asking the applicant to extend the sidewalk to, to match the existing sidewalk on Madison Lane. So there is a safe route of travel for kids trying to get to school in the neighborhood, trying to walk along the streets and all that. Um, Blind, dangerous corner that my kids have uh, been, you know, close to getting hit. By hey, David, I got to cut you off for a quick second. Sorry, something's going on with your microphone or the connection, and you're really hard to understand. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Okay, is, it, is that? Oh, you just well, muted. Now you're muted, but that was better. There you okay. go. Is that better? Okay. Got it. There you go. You got it. It still says I'm muted. Am I good? Okay. Yep, you're good. All right. So yes. Yeah, so it's it's a dangerous walking road, especially adding uh, more units to the to the property. So we would um, the neighborhood would request the opportunity to to extend that sidewalk to the existing sidewalk along Madison uh, Lane. And I know there are some trees in the way there uh, that you know I don't know if they would need to be removed or not, but um, we'd appreciate looking at that. And then the only other question I would have is. 
parking is a major issue on this road. Um, and so I just want to assure a lot of the parking for these units are in the two car garages. And I want to see if there's any type of um, uh, language in the CCNRs that are going to require those garages to be used for actual parking. I know in a lot of projects that I deal with, um, people are, you know, there, there's deed restrictions on the garages that they can't be used for storage, that they must be used for parking. Um, and I would just strongly, strongly encourage that be the case for this development. Um, because if we take four bed, eight four bedroom houses and people are using their garages for storage or other things, um, that's going to put a lot of cars on this road that it cannot handle. Um, there, it is a one-way exit road. There's no exit through the school. Um, it's only Madison Lane and with the restaurant, the school, and all the neighbors um, in this neighborhood. It's just, it's not conducive to having more cars on the street. Uh, so those are those are my my main comments, and I would just ask the commission to strongly consider those um, those options. Thank you for the time. Thank you, David. All right, uh, we will go to Richard Emig next. Good morning. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. And you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, there we go. All right. um, when we did the initial design of the three, the four duplexes, there was no requirement. We did not have to put a turnaround, fire turnaround. When it was required, we add the future duplex, we had to provide a turnaround. And the fire department approved the angle that comes in, and it will be marked so that nobody can park in that area. That's the only comment I wanted to add. Thank you, Richard. Um, all right, and let's see, Richard, your hand's still raised, but I'm gonna breeze past you there. Um, if there are any other members of the public who wish to speak at this time, please raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or the hand icon on your computer if you have the Zoom app. And I am not seeing any chair. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Drake. Um, appreciate everyone's comments. Typically, there is an opportunity at the end of public comment for the applicant to respond to any questions, and there was one. So I was wondering if Mr. Weaver would like to comment on the parking and the garages question. And and then we'll close public comment after that. Uh, Chair, yes. could we also ask the applicant to comment or staff to comment on Mr. Ramsey's concern about the sidewalk and extending it? Yes, please. Thank you. Mr. Weaver, if you're still available, would you want to comment any further? If not, you don't have to. And you are muted. I'm not sure if you're trying to talk. Is that better? Yes. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't think we have a problem with either of those. At this point, we usually you don't develop CCNRs, but if that were to be a condition that people park in the garage, I park in my garage, so I'm fine with that. Um, and as far as the sidewalks, I don't have a set of the plans sitting here in front of me, but I thought we were extending sidewalks down toward the cul-de-sac. And um, that would certainly be appropriate uh, given the amount of traffic and uh, people living along there in the school. So uh, I don't think we have a problem with either of those. Thank you so, so much. Do we need to add a condition of approval? On and where parking. exactly are we taking that sidewalk to? I was a little unclear based on uh, Mr. Ramsey's comments exactly where that sidewalk would be extended to. Well, it appears right now that the sidewalk is from the property line to the east. And then, you know, a little turn of the cul-de-sac on the west. Okay. So 
then it stops at the eastern property boundary there. Correct. Yes. So how far would that um, would it be desirable for that sidewalk to extend? That's what would be acceptable. Um, I think at this time, let's if we can finish the public comment portion and then and close that out and then come back to discussion around that. I would appreciate that. And then we'll also come back to the discussion on the garages because these Correct. are not for sale units, so CCNRs are not an appropriate um, mechanism. It would be the management company for the mm -hmm. units. Correct. Great. Um, then if there's no other questions of the applicant, we can close the public comment at this time and then move on to discussion. Um, sure, I'm seeing a couple of hands um, that just went up. I don't know if these are new, you know, comments that members of the public wish to provide or if they're related to the discussion that is occurring now. We sure. did not have any hands up a moment ago when I turned it back over mm -hmm. to you, but now we have four hands up, so. Mm. Um, okay. <laughs> Do you want to... We, it's, yeah, it's kind of tough because I don't, we close the public comment portion. What's typically done when this happens, Ms. Drake, do we move on or do we um, allow? This is, this is Daniel Sesweta, the County kind of Council's office. So, you. you know, you've, you've closed the public comment. Those who wish to participate had the opportunity to participate. Um, it's unclear as to whether folks who had already spoken are now raising their hands again. It, it's unclear at that point, but uh, we don't really have a way of, checking until we open the public comment period back up. So I don't I don't know if there's, uh, it's up to the chair to decide whether or not you want to open the public comment back up just to check on these names, but we did provide ample time for the public to participate in this. And if there are any comments that uh, have been emailed, I have not, I'm not sure, I'm not showing any other comments being put forth, but that's completely up to the chair. But I, like I said, I believe that we have had our public comment period. And so uh, you can move on if you wish. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think then if it's standard that we move on, let's go ahead and do that. And um, at this point, we're gonna bring it to the commission to discuss. So um, would any commissioners like to start? <laughs> I'd be happy to get started on a few discussion points here. Um, I'd like to understand, and Jocelyn, this might be a question for you also, is, you know, do we typically require parking in garages as on other projects? Have we been doing that? Is that standard practice um, or a requirement anywhere? It's not enforceable by, okay. you know, the planning staff. We we have had projects where there were con neighborhood concerns about parking, where we've included conditions of approval that the manage the management of the site uh, should you know should be a condition of the lease for the property, and that the property management uh, company would enforce that. Um, and we might also want to have a condition regarding conversion of these garage any garage spaces to um, ADUs as well. Mm -hmm. That would be something to consider. Okay, thank you. So um, that makes sense. And then as far as the sidewalk, you know, I'm not, my opinion is I'm not inclined to force an applicant to go out. I mean, this is on their property. They're doing all the sidewalk on their property. And it would be my inclination to be thankful that we have that. So an arbitrary like line of where someone wants the sidewalk fixed to doesn't seem like an appropriate way to get this fixed. Um, I'd love to hear the rest of the commission's you know thoughts on that. Um, that's kind of where I'm at on that point. And then as far as the parking, I don't know that if it's not enforceable and the county doesn't have a way to follow up on it and it's not standard practice, and it's not code. I 
you, you know, the applicant may be okay with that. And if, you know, if that's the case, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, but I'll lean to some other commissioners that have been here a little longer than me to carry on that conversation. As far as the garage conversions, I, I would not want to adjust any um, conditions to preclude that. That's a state law that allows, you know, ADU conversions as well as our local law that allows it. And, you know, I understand that parking is a challenge in this area. I totally understand that. Housing is also a challenge. I'm a little, I've been torn about this project because it, you know, if you used all the state bills and the bonuses and all the things, like you could get up to 31 units on this lot by, you know, not saying that that would all 100% fit, but that's what the numbers say. And so, you know, that we had a lot more back down to eight, which is kind of a, a challenge for us as a community because we're so behind on arena numbers. We need housing. We need affordable housing. We need all kinds of housing. And, um, you know, we're back down to this kind of lower end of our density range. And, you know, so um, I've been a little torn on this project from when I saw it. So I appreciate that the applicant kind of explained what had happened. And I'm, you know, this one, you know, it is, it's at where it's at. And I'm really excited to hear that the sewer moratorium is getting fixed, a future project with this kind of zoning, which is like one of the best zonings that we have for housing in our, in our county, you know, are gonna be able to utilize a little bit more density. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, Chair, this is Daniel Siswitha again, just yes. wanted to clarify. So the two questions that are being discussed at the present time are, are the sidewalks being extended past the property line and the idea that there would be a condition that uh, occupants or residents be parking in their garages. Is that correct? Those are okay. the, yes, sir. Those are okay. I just want to say just on the parking piece, there's, you know, I also want to just alert you to the challenges of enforcing that condition, right? I mean, there's, there's, I don't, I don't really think there's any precedent for forcing folks to park inside of their garages and for the county to police that is, is a completely different question. So I just want to make sure that the commissioners are uh, thinking about that. And as far as uh, stretching a sidewalk past um, the property line, I think you've addressed that already. Great. Thank you, Mr. Zizwet. I appreciate that feedback and input. Um, so those are all my thoughts on the project and uh, I'd love to hear other commissioners. I I do have uh, comments on what Mr. Ramsey was talking about, that sharp curve, which is a blind corner. It's almost a 90 degree turn actually. And from looking at the drawings, it appears to me that the easternmost entry and exit lane to the property is near that, that blind, very narrow turn. I was wondering if um, Mr. Weaver would still be available to tell us how far it is to the entry and exit way. I don't have that information right at the tip of my fingers. Um, I, I'm looking at it quickly. I would say it's about 100 from the actual corner, um, around 180 feet to where that driveway is from the corner itself. Okay. The, um, the, I had another comment. The uh, Well, I had two other comments. Are there any plans to improve Madison Lane? I was out there and I just found it almost impassable. I was out there at the time when parents are picking up the students at three o'clock. And I think there are 130 cars that pass at that time. Are there any improvements planned for Madison Lane? Beyond the improvements to the section directly fronting the property, uh, there are no improvements planned for that section between SoCal Drive and the corner. Okay, but the improvement in front of the property would not take in this blind curve, I'm guessing. 
No, because the property doesn't extend to the corner. There are, um, if the tr if the sidewalk were to be extended, there's, there are significant trees that are in the way of extending that sidewalk. Large redwood, I believe. Okay, my, my last question is, this has been proposed as a 10 unit apartment complex. Are these all rentals? Yes. Okay, are they, is there any prohibition about using them as vacation rentals? Um, typically a rent, a, a, an apartment cannot be used as a vacation rental. The applicant would be the property owner who would own all 10. That's correct. Not individual, you know, individuals could not apply. But they could sublet to a vacationer? No, not, not legal with a permit, no. Okay. They could, they could, they could sublet you know, right. on a long-term basis, but they, uh, if, if that was allowed by the management company, but not as a vacation rental, not legally. Right, a vacation rental is less is thirty is less than thirty days. Um, any rental um, more than thirty days is just a rental. I I don't think we have anything on the books to prevent. I, I guess what Commissioner Lazen is wanting to know what's to keep them from being used as, uh, you know, vacation homes any more, you know, short-term rentals any more than any other apartment? Where, how do we legislate that? Let's just review it in a few sentences. Um, we do not allow apartments to be rented, uh, to be, uh, to obtain um, vacation rental permits, apartment owners, apartment renters. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the clear answer. Okay, I have I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Um, I, I do have. I would like to hear a little bit more. It seems like County Council has uh, provided us guidance in regards to the issue um, of uh, prohibiting certain uses in the garage. So I I don't feel the need to go into that anymore, but. The applicant did indicate um, a willingness to work on the sidewalk issue. And I'm curious from staff, do you think that it's appropriate that maybe you work with the applicant to see if something can be done in regards to that extension? Um, I would want to work with uh, the road engineering section uh -huh. um, before making any comments on that. That's not my area of expertise. Um, I, I say I do believe that there would be an existing tree that would um, prevent the extension of the sidewalk in front of, uh, there's, a, there's a house that's sort of on the eastern property line there. And I, I'm not sure that, I know they do use that area for parking. Um, and I'm not sure what would be involved in doing that and whether that would be supported by that neighbor. It, it's hard for me to tell without you know, further studies. Okay, well, I would be prepared to make a motion and include in that motion that staff have a discussion with other public works or appropriate road staff about the possibility of creating an extension to the sidewalk. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas. Um, I'd, I'd like to, if we could dig into that just a bit more. Um, I believe that the adjacent property where you'd extend that to, you would have to build this sidewalk on someone else's property. And so that would include, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole lot more. That's why the prop, that's why the sidewalk stops where it does. That's my guess. Um, as, Cause we're not building into an existing street that just hasn't been developed yet. We're taking a private property and giving 
the sidewalk essentially to the public. Does that make sense? So the neighbor next door would have to accept the same thing. Um, is Mr. Machado, you're here. Um, do you know anything about that? Am I right or wrong? Is that something that's enforceable or possible? I, I'm not opposed to it. I just want to make sure that we are actually, that was something that could be done. Well, two thoughts on it. Um, extending the sidewalk across others' frontage certainly has impacts to those people. And so, you know, there could be an unwillingness uh, for those adjacent landowners to cooperate with any sort of sidewalk extension. The public right of way is very limited in this area. Most of Madison is like a 30 foot right of way. So we'd have to really see if there's even room uh, within the public right of way. Otherwise, you would also have to um, acquire an easement from the adjacent property owners. But at a minimum, even if there were enough a public right of way to fit a sidewalk in there, it would certainly affect the neighbor's property. And most of those people have, you know, trees, fences, um, you know, their yards have been developed fairly close up to the edge of the pavement. Uh, so it would be a challenge. It would certainly require a lot of coordination with the adjacent landowners and cooperation. And so it'd be, un I, I would say it's unsure whether there, that cooperation would exist. It's also unclear if there's enough public right-of-way which could necessitate the acquisition of additional easements, which is a pretty, that's a pretty big burden. Um, it'd be a pretty big lift. Uh, certainly we could discuss it more, um, but that's, that's what I see looking at, um, you know, the GIS and, and uh, the mapping that I can see in front of us today. Thank you so much for clearing that up. Um, you know, with that thought, Commissioner Freitas, would you want to maybe adjust how we would word that, um, knowing that we'd have to take over the you know public works would have to assist in like an easement onto private property where others may not want that? So just if I may just interrupt quickly, I just received an email from Dave Ramsey. Um, who is a civil engineer, and he's saying that he would be happy to discuss the extension of the sidewalk with road engineering. Um, he also says that the adjacent property owner is more than happy to remove the trees mm -hmm. and doesn't use parking, although I can see in the street view that he is using some of the right way for parking. Um, the redwood itself could remain, and there's one other tree um, he says it's not a heritage tree. We don't have heritage trees in the county, and it's not in the coastal zone, so it would not be a significant tree, and that would need to be removed. It is quite a sizable tree. Um, that, that was his comment. I, I believe he tried to speak at the hearing, but because it was past the public comment, he, he was not um, that opportunity. Uh, Chair Gordon? Yes. I'm not going to support removing trees, helter-skelter, uh, at the last minute. It, this is not how I would like to proceed in the least. We want to get it studied. That's one thing. But I, I do not think that we need to do the planning department's job here. I would not support a motion going in that direction at all. And, Chair, this is Daniel Seswatha again, if I might weigh in just a bit. I think we're kind of getting outside of the bounds of this, the approval or denial of this actual permit and to, exactly. tie, to tie anything which could be neighbors discussing this issue with, with county staff, which is what is appropriate here. I think we shouldn't tie any of this to this particular permit. Thank you. Also, there was a neighborhood meeting where the proposal was explained to neighbors and we owe something to what they think is going to happen there. I don't, I do not think that justifies this kind of last minute change with us acting in lieu of proper planning. So I won't support it. Thank you all for those comments. Yes, completely understand. Um, I, I would agree. I think that adding things last minute without research or um, really taking the time to dig in and with all these, all of these challenges that we just immediately brought up, it's pretty clear that we would need some more study. And so I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I'm ready to move, make a motion uh, to approve the project. In fact, I will make, you know, if that's appropriate at this point. <laughs> I think if other and commissioners, that, oh, go ahead. Let me just clarify, that would be with the addition of the uh, language regarding that um, 
the drainage condition, just that unless the property improvements in the county right away are constructed to comply with county design criteria standards, that they would have maintenance. I will add that as just. Yes, I was definitely assuming that. Thank you for bringing it up. I, I think this is a well-designed project, thoughtful and well-planned out and long time in the making. It certainly adds moderate more apartments, which is something we need. I won't even comment on how we could pack 31 units in there, given the source <laughs> situation, the road situation, the neighbor yeah. situation, the goal situation, so on and so forth. But I think right now it's a well-designed addition uh, to housing. I'd like to vote for it. And that's fine with me. I, I appreciate the discussion. I think it was worth having. Um, but I would ask the maker of the motion if um, she would include adopting the CEQA mitigated negative deck and the mitigation measures and certifying, certifying the mitigated negative deck pursuant to the requirements of CEQA and then to approve the application. If, if those modifications could be made to her motion. Thank I you. Would that, um, absolutely. I should have included all that when I said okay. I need approval and that fills it out to weigh it. Need, legally needs to be. So let's add that to motion. And now we have a second. Can we call the question if there's no other discussion? I didn't believe I, I heard a second on that. I, that's that was, uh, that I was, asked the maker of the motion to make those changes and that I would second it with those changes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Freitas. I missed that. I appreciate that. I did too. Thank okay, great. So we do have a motion from Commissioner Shepard and a second from Commissioner Freitas. If there's any other discussion, we can hear it now, otherwise we can take a roll call vote. Okay. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Schaefer Freitas? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? <laughs> Commissioner Lazenby. You are muted, Judy. I wasted all of that. Okay. No, I, I, I cannot support this project based on verbal assurances, which should have been documented in reports that we can actually verify what has been said in this meeting. So my vote is no. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. And uh, Chair Gordon. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone, with that. Um, so I, I think we, let's just say that we passed it and so ordered. <laughs> Correct. Motion yes, passes. passes. Three, two, one. And we do not have Rachel Dan with us today. So she is a no vote. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That was a, that was a fun one. <laughs> getting back into this after a couple months off. You're getting through it. <laughs> um, so with that, we'll close agenda item number eight and move on to agenda, nine, uh, excuse me, agenda item number nine. This one in particular has actually been rescheduled to July 13th. And so we won't have any discussion on this one today. Um, with that, we can move to item 10, planning director's report, Mr. Machado. Thank you, chair and commissioners. Just a couple items to share with the commission uh, this morning. Uh, first up, um, a quick update on our Unified Permit Center efforts. And so uh, for the past couple months, uh, public works and planning staff have coordinated together to share the front counter, the existing front counter, to, to uh, improve our communications with our constituents. They're also sharing uh, the same scheduling tool to ensure that when uh, customers, constituents come in and ask questions, that all the appropriate people are there. Uh, this is a effort towards the new Unified Permit Center, which uh, part of this update is also to share that those design efforts have started and uh, we're hopeful over the next uh, one to two years to construct a new lobby, a new front counter where uh, public works staff, planning staff will work together uh, shoulder to shoulder to 
improve coordination with uh, customers and constituents. We will also be focused on uh, the customer experience, trying to make it a more welcoming, uh, a more useful space for, for all of our constituents. And so that's a little bit about the, the UPC, uh, an update there. Secondly, I'd like to share that um, our sustainability update is going quite well. Uh, some of you may have attended. We've had uh, six community meetings. And I think, do I see, I don't see Stephanie Hansen on the, on the call today. Otherwise, I would turn it to her uh, to share more detail. But I, I would like to share that we've had six community meetings uh, to share with the community our sustainability update. Uh, additionally, the uh, draft EIR is out for public review uh, today. Oh, I see Stephanie now. Good. Yeah, I'm going to introduce. I, I just missed you there, Stephanie. So um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Stephanie to provide an update to the commission on our sustainability update and our EIR efforts. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Matt. I was... Um not properly elevated, I think. And I'm trying to turn on my camera to not see how to do that. Okay, hang on. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, commissioners. Um, as Matt mentioned, um, we have been having community meetings on the sustainability update. We've had a lot of um, good input. Um, and starting at your next meeting on May 25th, uh, staff is preparing a series of study sessions on the sustainability update um, uh, for the commission. Um, the first study session would be an overview of the project and subsequent um, study sessions will focus on um, policies and regulations associated with topics, um, kind of focused on the, um, the, the big picture highlights. Um, and uh, while there's a lot of detail in the sustainability update, there's a lot of moving things around, um, we really want the commission to be able to focus on the major changes. Um, uh, the next study sessions would uh, focus on the built environment and land use. Um, next up would be transportation and public facilities. This be followed by another session on the code modernization uh, portion of the project, as well as agriculture and other natural resources. And we'll also give a briefing on the EIR at that meeting. Um, a fifth study session could uh, could accommodate any topics that the commission wishes to uh, return to. Public hearings at the commission would begin in August and go through September. We're anticipating uh, two public hearings right now, but a third hearing could be scheduled as an additional meeting if needed. Um, the board will have uh, public hearings in October through early December with the intent of adopting the amendments by the end of the year. The sustainability update is a very large project involving general plan amendments, county code amendments, new uh, development design guidelines, and map amendments. Uh, we encourage the commissioners to become familiarized with the project beforehand. Um, by visiting the project website where um, you can find the draft documents that have been out for public review since uh, the end of February. And um, on the website, there are also links to all the documents and um, uh, as well as additional materials um, and particularly recordings to the series of community meetings that have been held this the spring, these are an excellent way to kind of grab, you know, a full understanding of what's in the project and, and delve into a little bit more detail by topic. I can follow up with an email to the commissioners um, that provide the appropriate links. Um, because the draft documents are approximately 2,500 pages, we encourage the commissioners to review the documents using the links. Um, and I guess with that, I'll turn it back to, to Matt or, or Jocelyn. Or I'm happy to answer any questions. I had a question. Uh, 
the document is 2,500 pages long. So is there a summary that is much shorter? Yeah, yeah very good question. Um, uh, I can provide this in the email to direct you where to go exactly, but the project description that is in the uh, in the EIR provides a really good summary of the whole thing. And so that would be the best way to see that. And how long is that? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's maybe 80 pages, something like that. And where is it available where someone else has printed it out? In the library? Um, the EIR is available at the um, planning department counter. No, I meant the summary that you were talking about. Is right. that that's part of the EIR? That's part of the EIR. And so what are we actually going to get to look at? I'm not going to try and read 2,500 pages online. Right, which is why we're trying to find ways to um, summarize materials and focus in on highlights and the important changes that are in, in this project. Um, but we can we can also follow up with um, uh, good ways to try to get a handle on it. And again, like I said, the community meetings are a really good way to understand what's in the project and can be done at the commission's leisure. Well, if we're going to have a study session, I'd like to have some pages of text that I can actually read. I spend my whole day, as most people do, at a computer, and that's asking a lot to read, even 80 pages online. You can print on both sides. Um, but we generally have received some with big, important countywide projects like this. I'd actually like to spend some time studying it. Right, and that's why we're encouraging you to do this, but we could um, we could attach the EIR um, project description to the staff report as well. I think that would be most helpful. Okay. Also, I, I just wanted to say I'm a little off topic, but it is customary for us to see all the will serve letters as part of staff reports. And I, I understand why Judy is so upset. So I want to make sure this obviously project we just passed changed hands a time or two, but I do think that is important for us all to see. Sorry, this is off topic, Stephanie. Um, I, I just want to say congratulations on finishing the, all this work on the sustainability mm -hmm. section. And I very much look forward to looking at it closely. That's why I want to make sure I can get it in a form wherein I can do that. Because saying, oh, yeah, I'll just read 80 pages tonight online. I'm, I don't you know, as a planning commissioner with another full time job, it's just not realistic, or, or not let alone 2,500 pages. But yeah, congratulations, it, it's, a it, mon it's, it's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, thank you. Um, the team is very happy to have the amendments out in, in the, the public and to be moving forward with adoption. So we, we appreciate the commission's um, uh, support on that. Thank you, Stephanie. And Commissioner Shepard, uh, loud and clear on the, uh, the will serve letters. Uh, we agree that's an important piece and so we'll We'll be sure to to make those available on the future projects. Thank you. And uh, Chair, that completes uh, the report for this morning. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to add, I'm, you know, thank you for all the work that goes into especially sustainability updates, a big deal. Is it is I just want to be clear, is this the like means to meeting the arena numbers? Are we up zoning essentially in this sustainability update? Yeah, no? thank you. That's, that's that's a good question. Um, the sustainability update uh, definitely provides the policy and regulatory framework for how we are going to try to meet our RENA, um, which would happen next year in as we update our housing elements. So housing elements, not part of the sustainability update, be a whole separate project next year. Um, the sustainability update includes updated regulations and also includes a new residential flex um, zoning district, and that'll be key to um, uh, rezoning properties to, to meet our RENA. Um, if the commission wasn't aware, the 
uh, AMBAG did pass the uh, final RENA methodology after approval by the state and um, the county, the county's allocation is 4,634 units over eight years. So we'll have a, a lot of work to do and additional rezonings um, as a part of that project next year. Um, the sustainability update, however, does include um, an initial start at this with the rezoning of uh, 10 parcels to residential flex to try to get a head, head start on that and provide more housing a little bit earlier. Um, I had another question for Stephanie. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I really wondered. When the state gives out these new quotas, looking, for example, at Scott Valley, um, the state just gives them out. Do they? Does their department take any preliminary work at all in turning what places like Scott Valley can provide in terms of resources, for example, water, um, which is a big issue because... Uh, I've talked to people at Scott Valley, and they have no idea how they have enough water for what that quota has been given to them. They don't think they do. Other places don't have sewer capacity. Does the state even look at that, or do they just declare, this is what we'd like to have you do, and then it is really up to the local communities, the counties and the cities, to decide what they really can do. Everyone's motivated, but there are finite resources here. And, and there yeah. seems to be a big disconnect between these state quotas and what's actually accomplishable uh, in terms of, you know, infrastructure. Yeah, the um, to, to give a brief overview of the process, the state hands down a number of units to the um, COGS, to the um, Council of Governments. So AMBAG is the one for our particular region. Um, that number was around 33,000. Um, I think they they look for um, the methodology is complicated. Um, I, I think they look for places where we need um, uh, additional housing. And this particular cycle was all about providing opportunities for more affordable housing and addressing equity issues. Um, so all the COGS um, got, um, allocations that were much larger than they had previously. And, um, uh, and so I think that they do look at some things, but then uh, the breakdown and, and um, the, the dissemination of those units among the jurisdictions is developed in the methodology um, that is developed with the uh, planning directors and, and AMBAG. And there were a lot of meetings on this. Um, we, we revised the typical methodology by um, trying to put more uh, units where we have transit facilities and um, to take into account uh, something we called a resiliency factor. So if you were a, um, uh, a jurisdiction that uh, is subject to a lot of wildfires or sea level rise, um, that factor was included and um, an adjustment made in the, in the methodology. Um, things like water and sewer are also in the methodology, but it, uh, didn't solve the problem for areas like Scotts Valley or um, Monterey in particular has moratoriums on, on uh, issuing water um, will serve letters. So uh, that's defined by the state. So it's very, it's not only a little complicated, um, it's very imperfect. And I would say all jurisdictions are, are going to be struggling to figure out how they can accommodate those units for, for all of our situations. Well, frankly, that, that's helpful. In other words, the answer is sort of, but not really. So the state looks, gets the political kudos of having said, yes, we should have toward all this much housing. And then the local communities are in the position of saying, well, do we have the water? Do we have the roads? Can we accommodate that much growth? And so they're always going to be in an awkward position in Scotts Valley. You know, Scotts yes. Valley is a really good example. They they just don't have the water. So where are they going to get it? Can't make more. 
Yeah, and there's other um, imperfections as well. And well, um, imperfections it, is a generous and political <laughs> way of of saying what the system that needs. It seems just I I was just kind of curious, and you've explained it, so you know. Don't feel like you have to defend it. It just is what it is. So you kind of answered my question. Thank I you. wasn't going to defend it, but I, I did want to add that the other problem here is actually meeting the arenas, which is very um, is very much out of a local jurisdiction's control. Um, so there's only so much we can do because we're not housing developers. So that's, that's the other big issue with it. Yes, I understand you can allocate housing, but you can't. We're not in a position to build it. That's got to be private development. But that's a whole other subject. I just wanted some of these numbers just seem to have been drawn without paying attention to resources at all. And I was just wondering what the process is. Thank you for attempting to explain something that does, still doesn't make much sense to me. But thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, when are we going to start meeting? In, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Shepard. That's okay. Oh, that's okay. I'm done. With that. Okay, I was just gonna say thanks for that um, update. I think today's hearing was a good reminder of like why these community meetings are so important. A lot of the community has input when it comes to specific projects, but you know where they really need to give the input is in these updates and general plan updates, and um, so that we're not making one-off decisions on project specifics that are you know maybe okay, maybe not. So I, I'm. I'm really glad that we're doing this and I'm, I'm hoping you're getting a good turnout. Uh, yeah, you know, it's been, it's been okay. Um, some have been better than others. Um, I think it's really helpful that we have the recordings available um, on, on YouTube. So we know that people are continuing to access those even though they might've missed the meetings. Um, so technology has really helped us out. Um, this time around, um, which is great. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of the nature of public involvement is that um, you might not get really good input until it's a development in somebody's backyard. And yeah. that's, that's unfortunate, but we are giving it our all to do that public outreach for sure. Thank you. Unless anyone else has any questions, I, we can move on. But I appreciate the report, Mr. Machado and Ms. Hanson. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have a report on any upcoming meeting dates and agendas, Ms. Drake? Um, yes. We have, um, currently we know, at least at this point in time, that we um, expect to have meetings on May 25th, June 8th, uh, June 22nd and July 13th um, because we still have time for the June uh, meetings and beyond. We may be adding um, additional meeting dates or items to those dates, but it looks like so far um, those ones are a go. As Stephanie mentioned, um, we're going to be getting into the sustainability update study session, so we're going to have a busy summer. Um, and I think Renee was getting ready to ask so um, about bringing the meetings back to the chamber. So I might uh, just touch on that, which is um, we are trying to bring the Planning Commission meetings back to the chambers in June. Um, however, we've been testing a new hybrid meeting format and we haven't quite gotten it worked out. So um, I will keep the Planning Commission updated on the progress we are making. Um, if we aren't able to get the meetings back in the chamber and feel that they will be successful, we will continue with the remote meetings until we've got the glitches worked out. Um, but that is our goal, is coming back in June. Thank you for um, responding to my email inquiry with a poll of the planning commissioners um, checking in to see if you would like to come back. And it sounds like the consensus is planning commissioners would like to come back to the chambers. So looking forward to that. And that is all I have, Chair. What are we going to be talking about uh, in the second meeting in May? What's on the agenda? Um, on the agenda, the second meeting in May, 
Mike, are you still with us? Yes, um, I think that's the first sustainability update study session. And so far, that's the only item we have on the agenda. Thanks, Mike. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. Busy summer. Um, looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any update from County Council today? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to let the commissioners know that yesterday the board adopted the wireless regulations that you all worked so hard to uh, review and provide very substantive and nice comments to. I just want to let you know that. And other than that, I have nothing to report. That's good. Um, well, that's that's it. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate everyone's help and feedback today. You know, some tricky questions in there, and we got through it, so I appreciate that. And uh, looking forward to get back in it. And sorry, I'm a little rusty today. We'll get, but I'll get there. Uh, so, um, with that, we can conclude the hearing, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys on the 25th.